are the one that's lifted it up, lifted us up, raised us, oh Father, to resurrected places. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. We're thankful. We're thankful for Jesus and his willingness to go to the cross and bear the sins of this world so that we could have a relationship with you today and for all eternity. And we rejoice in that. We rejoice in your forgiveness. We rejoice in your mercy. Oh, Lord, we rejoice in your presence. Oh, Father, we would ask, oh, Lord God, as we continue this service today, that you would minister to us and build us up. May your kingdom continue to be advanced, oh, Father God, in our lives. And, Father God, we just give you the glory, give you the honor, and give you the praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You may, you may be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just been made aware that Jeff's mother has been put on hospice care. What's your mom's name, Jeff? My, Barbara? Barbara Myers. Let's, let's lift up Barbara in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask, O oh Lord God, for Barbara. We ask, O oh Lord God, that you'll intervene in her situation. We're thankful, O oh Lord God, that she has a relationship with you and that she's looking forward to walking through that threshold into glory. And Father God, we pray that you would be with her during this time. You would comfort her. You would bring her peace. Oh, Father God, she's in your care and in your hands, and we trust you, oh, Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Are there any other special needs that we need to lift up today? I don't see Russell here. Does any, anybody know where Russell is? Okay. Uh, what she said that someone in his he's been exposed to to COVID and he didn't want to come so let's just pray for Russell Heavenly Father we're thankful for Russell he's been through a lot as of late and we just pray for your comfort your peace in his life oh Father God we're thankful Lord that you have a peace that passes all understanding and Father we just ask for that in the name of Jesus Amen 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 Yes. Okay, Sister, Sister Young, okay. Heavenly Father, we lift up Sister Young before you. You know the situation that she's experiencing. Oh, Father God, we'd ask, oh Lord, for your comfort, your peace, that you would be with her, strengthening her, oh Lord God, through this. We're thankful, Lord, that she knows you, has a relationship with you. But Father God, we pray, oh Lord, that you will be with her as she continues this journey. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Yes. Amen. Heavenly Father, we, we're thankful to be the part of the Assemblies of God. We're thankful, Lord, to be First Assembly God here in, here in Raytown. We ask, O oh Lord God, that you'll be with those churches that are having their business meetings this month. We pray, O oh Lord, that there'll be times of, of excitement, there'll be times of vision, times, O oh Lord God, where people are gathering together to get ready, O oh Lord, for the, for the task at hand and the journey ahead. And Father God, we pray for our fellowship. We ask, O oh Lord God, that you would allow us, O oh Lord God, to go forward in faith, to be men and women of faith, O oh Lord God, for the furtherance of your kingdom. And we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise be to the Lord. God is good, isn't he? Hallelujah. And all the time. Amen. Um, a while back... You know, I, I shared with you a message on, uh, on David, because the, the Bible says that David 
is a man after God's own heart. And so I think it's a pretty good idea to do character studies on individuals that are proclaimed to be what God wants them to be in Scripture so that we can emulate some of those traits. And uh, how many of you want to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? And so a study of David or looking into his life, looking into his attributes, his character qualities, those are the things that God declares are man after his own heart. I'm not going the way of David today, but just recently the Lord was ministering to me because it says in Scripture that uh, Satan went before God. And God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? It wasn't Satan that brought up Job, it was God that brought up Job. He said, have you considered my servant Job? He is a perfect and upright man. How many of you want to be a perfect and upright man or woman? We desire to hear that. How many of you want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord? I want to hear that. I want to be a man after God's own heart. I want to be a perfect and upright man. And so God has not left us clueless as to what that means. Because he shows us in the character qualities of David what a man after his own heart has, or the qualities that he has in his life. And I believe that as we read and study the book of Job, we will also see what a perfect and upright man is like. And again, that's our desire and goal. We want to stand before God someday and hear those words, well done. He's going to tell us, well done, if we are a man after his own heart. He's going to tell us, well done, if we're a perfect and upright man. Amen? We want to hear those words, so we should strive to be that man or woman that he wants us to be. Allowing the Lord to develop. You know, the key is, is that God is willing to do a lot of work in our lives, but what we need to do is get out of the way. Our job, as John the Baptist made, he said, our job is to become less so that he, Jesus, can become more. Right? God's going to do the work, but we need to get out of the way. Amen? And as we get out of the way, God can refine us and God can make us into the men and women of God that he desires us to be. I'm thankful for that, aren't you? And uh, in Job chapter 1, starting right with uh, the first chapter of Job in the first verse, it says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Uh, Job is declared to be perfect and upright. It starts right there. Later on, we'll, we'll read in Scripture where uh, it says that Satan came before God, and he says, where, are you, where have you been? He says, I've been wandering around the earth. And then God brings up, have you considered my servant Job? Now, we recognize the, the trials. We recognize the, uh, the situations that Job experienced in his life were very unpleasant. But it was, in a sense, God proving to Satan that a man that has a relationship with him who is perfect and upright will continue to be faithful in spite of of the difficulties and problems of life. I want to be that man, don't you? We, we do experience difficulties. We do experience problems. Job remained faithful. Job remained faithful. Um, what are the qualities that make one perfect and upright before the Lord? Well, I don't believe this is totally exhaustive, but uh, we can look at Job's life and we can see some of these qualities in his life that would receive that declaration that Job is a perfect and upright man. And I want to reflect 
for a few moments this morning on these character qualities of Job. And then I want to show you God's response to the upright, as well as God's response to those who are outside of his will. And Job reveals that to us. And then I want to challenge you as the church of Jesus Christ to seek the qualities in your life that God's going to bless. To seek to put yourself in a position of blessing and avoiding those behaviors that God is displeased with. Well, let's look at some of these qualities of Job. Let's first of all talk about his relationship with his family. Number one, uh, as far as dealing with his family, he made sacrifices for his sons. And I want to share this with you. This is from Job chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. It says, his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. So there's his, his sons and his daughters. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So a perfect and upright man like Job is a person that has a burden and a concern for the spiritual welfare of his children. And Job was willing, listen, Job was willing to sacrifice on behalf of his children. I, I recognize the, uh, an illustration I had. I've, I, I have six children, and growing up, as they were growing up, I, I recognized the love and, the, cons- and the, the, relation, the importance they've been in my life, in my wife's life. And uh, I, I told people this, if, if one of my sons was ever attacked by a lion and I was there, you'd probably find their dead daddy with a lion's ear somewhere in my mouth. Okay, I would give that lion, that lion, that lion may win, but he's going to know he was in a fight. <laughs> All right, I, if, if they were in front of a train and a train was coming, I used to say these statements, it wouldn't take but a moment for me to dive on the tracks just to push them away because of that. And yet, uh, when the Buffalo Bills are playing football, they played football last night, by the way, in fact, I stayed up and watched that. And for those of you that know me, that's rare. <laughs> when the Buffalo Bills are playing football and, and son comes in and says, hey, Dad, can you come outside and throw the ball around with me? I, hey, can't you see I'm watching the game? Leave me alone. It's a whole lot easier to sacrifice in death than it is to sacrifice in life, isn't it? And you know what God wants us to do on behalf of our families is not just to be willing to die for them, but to be willing to live for them. To be willing to sacrifice our own interests and our own desires for the welfare of our children. And Job was willing to do this. He sacrificed his own desires, his own interests for the welfare of his children. He was willing to go that extra extra mile. Well, you may say, well, you know what, I... Maybe, maybe I don't do that. Well, maybe God's not saying that you're the perfect and upright man either. But that's what Job did. We're talking about Job. We're talking about a perfect and upright man. And he was willing to give his life and make sacrifices on behalf of his kids. I know one of the things that I would challenge you to do, those of you with children or grandchildren, Be a patriarch, be a matriarch of your family and lift them before the Lord daily. Lift them before the Lord daily. Intercede for them. If necessary, get on your face and cry out on behalf of your children. I believe that God honors the prayer of the faithful. I know years ago when I was living in rebellion, my mother would be, would be crying about some of the behaviors I had been involved in. I remember at that time she was writing letters to Oral Roberts, asking him to pray for me. 
But she, 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 she was interceding in her way. She was interceding for me because she cared for me and she wanted the best for me. And you know what? We need to be that way for our children. We need to intercede. We need to sacrifice. We sacrifice our own time, our own desires, but more importantly than that, sacrifice. One of the things that, that my kids learned real quickly is, is that I was going to be friendly, but I wasn't their friend. I was their daddy. I was going to treat them friendly, but I was their daddy. And I needed to set an example, and I was going to be their leader. And I was going to guide them in the ways of the Lord. And, and sometimes I wasn't popular. When the church doors were open, my kids were in church. I didn't ask them if they, I didn't ask what the vote was, whether they wanted to be there. I told them what the vote was because I voted. And you're going. And if you live in my house, you're going to go there. Because this is where you need to be. You need to, you need to hear the word. And there's some kids, they might be playing games, they may be doing other things while the word is being preached, but I believe that the word gets through. God's word can break through that resistance. But being there, being in places like that, our kids recognized right from the start that we, we weren't, in, in, in many cases, it was making sacrifices as to not being the most popular parents on the block. Well, well, Johnny's parents let him do this, and Sally's parents let him do that. And basically what we said, you know, we're making these sacrifices for you because we're concerned about your eternity. We're concerned about your spirituality. We're concerned that you're going to live a life that honors God. And Job was a man that was perfect and upright. In verse 9 and 10 of chapter 2, Job's wife went astray. And Job is going through these problems. He's going through these difficulties in his life. And he's remaining integral to the principles of God. And his, wife's, his wife comes to him and rebukes him and, uh, or criticizes him. His wife said unto him in verse 9, Dost thou still... and I. Let me give a little inflection to this. Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. How would you like a wife like that? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we re not receive evil? In all this, did not Job sin with his lips? You know, one of the things that Job did is he rebuked his wife because she was wrong and living in sin. And sometimes we let family be bigger and direct us more than the Spirit of God. We need to be led by the Spirit of God. And if it means rebuking, if it means bringing to the attention even of family members, we're, we may not get the Christmas cards that year, but it's important to do so. It's important for us to stand up for righteousness. Men, it's important for you to have a backbone. It's important for you to stand up on the truths of God and be a spiritual leader in your home. And to say as Joshua did, he didn't say, you know what, let me pull my house and see if everybody wants to serve you. Is that what it says in Joshua 24, 15? No, it says, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we need to make that stand, amen? Job made that stand, even amongst family members that were opposed to what God was doing and opposed to his integrity. He made the stand, and he declared the truth of God's word. Amen? We need to do that. That's who we need to be. I'm not telling you to be annoying, rude, or abrasive, but I'm telling you to be truthful and stand before the Lord accountable for being the man or woman that he wants you to be. I remember going home from school one day. I wouldn't consider my mother to be what you, what you would label as a spiritual giant, but she was... She was a spiritual giant in my, when I was young, no doubt about it. I went home from school one day, and I said, Mom, I was in school, I saw the charts. You know, we came from monkeys. 
I mean, they had the charts. On, I, I, they, I, you know, they had the charts. They had to be right. They were in school, you know. And I remember her telling me, she said, uh, well, her, the way she put it, she said, you might come from a monkey, but I didn't. <laughs> you know, she, she, ba she basically told me, you know, she brought it out. You know what? I don't care what the school says. This is what we believe in this house. This is where we stand. This is the truth that we hold on to. It's important for us to do that. We live in a world that it, I think it's very clear. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not reading anything into this. We live in a, a world today that's becoming more and more apostate. A world that's becoming more and more ungodly. Promoting, teaching those things that are contradictory to the words of God. And the will of God. And the ways of God. Nowadays, the LGBTQ community is being promoted and identified almost as a minority group and, and with minority status. Years ago, they were in the closet. You know, and it was labeled as, in, in fact, it was labeled almost as a mental, ish, a mental problem. Um, and this is even in my lifetime. But there's been a change. There's been a shift. And we see this, this cloud, this dark cloud of apostasy blowing in. It was, it was years ago that it was ba back in 1926, I believe it was. This, I believe that's when the Scopes Monkey Trial was, when they were trying to promote Darwinism and evolution in the schools. It was brought before there, and, and it was defeated. And it was saying, no way should that be taught in, in our school system. And they said, we believe in a creator. That's, a bunch of, that's just a bunch of garbage. We're not going to teach that. And, and something's happened. My mother was born in 1926. Something's happened from the time that she was born. I mean, she's gone to be with the Lord now. But there's something happened in that period of time to nowadays you go into school, you say you believe in creation, and they, they put you over in the corner as someone that needs to be indoctrinated. Because you're not believing the reality that you are, you are the product of two tiny amoebas swimming in a pool of prehistoric slime and an explosion occurred and poof, there you are. Right? We see these things and how important it for us as parents and as leaders in the church to bring these truths to our kids and our grandkids. To say, you know what, you're going to hear this in school, but it's not true. You're going to hear this in the world that you live in, but the world is going against God. And to uplift those principles, otherwise they're going to be sucked in like a big vacuum cleaner. And if that's all they've been taught and that's all they know, then that's what they'll become. We have a big responsibility, don't we? Job recognized that he was a man that was perfect and upright. His personal integrity. In Job 31.1, it says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Job made an agreement with himself. He said, I will not look on another woman. I will not look on another woman. I will not look on her to have her or to lust after her. I've made a covenant. I made a contract with my eyes. Maybe you haven't done that. Well, Job was perfect and upright, and Job did it. And God declared him a perfect and upright man. Amen? He was a man of integrity, a man that was willing to make a covenant with his eyes. And in Job chapter 27, verses 2 and 4, it says, All the while... My breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Job showed the personal integrity and qualities of a perfect and upright man. He says, I will not talk about those things that are wicked. I will never tell a lie. It doesn't matter how convenient it is or how personally beneficial it is. My mouth will not speak deceit. You say, well, I haven't fully made that commitment. Well, he was talking about Job, 
a perfect and upright man. It is who we want to be. We want that label, don't we? We want that label. And to make that commitment, you know what? No matter how convenient it is, no matter how it looks like it's going to lead to my prosperity, if I just tell this lie or, or present this level of deceit, Job said, as long as I have God's breath in my nostrils, I will not speak wickedness, nor will my mouth utter deceit. A perfect and upright man. Well, what was God's view toward this? Because, or no, let's look at this. What was uh, Job's view toward God? Now, Job was going through some difficult times. He's experiencing, I mean, he, he didn't know why. You know, his children were killed. He was losing his possessions. He was experiencing uh, some health issues. He's going through his body's covered in boils. He's, he's experiencing some difficult issues. And in verse, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Then Job arose, and he ran his mantle, which is, a, which is a sign of mourning. He shaved his head, and he fell down on the ground and worshipped. And uh, in my notes, I got that highlighted. And worshipped. He's going through all these problems. You know what? He did not blame God. He worshipped God. He did not blame God for the sickness. He did not blame, blame God for the loss of his family members. He did not blame God for the loss of his possessions. He fell down before God and he worshipped. And he said, these are his words, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. This guy, this guy lifts me up. I mean, this is who I want to be. You know, all these calamities, all these problems. He didn't blame God. He worshiped God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then I like this last part of the verse. It says, in all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. It's time for us to say, why, instead of saying, why, God? Why did you let this happen to me? In other words, God, you could have stopped it. I've got some charges against you. You allowed me to experience pain, and you could have stopped it. You could have allowed me not to experience sickness. You could have stopped it. And we begin to file charges against God. They are slanted. You know, it's not, it's not coming right out and saying, God, I charge you. But Job didn't charge God foolishly. He recognized, I'm experiencing some difficulties. I'm experiencing some, some problems in my life. But God has not changed. He remains. He remains the same. He deserves my worship. <laughs> and, and I will not charge God foolishly. I will praise him. Hallelujah. I will praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He then he acknowledged that God can do anything. He recognized that there wasn't anything that God couldn't do or take care of. He made this statement. Then Job answered. This is from chapter 42, verses 1 and 2. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and no thought can be withholded from thee. He recognized that he served a God that was able to do anything. He didn't get to the point where he put limitations on God. And sometimes we do, I believe, put limitations on God by saying, I know he can do it, but. Or God, I, I, know, I know God can, can do it, but, but maybe he won't do it in this case. And what we need to do is we need to just recognize, hey, wait a second. God's in control. He can do anything. And I'm willing, I'm willing to submit to God's direction and God's empowerment. Amen. Hallelujah. He goes on. And uh, again, this is Job's response to the Lord. In, in Job 42, verse 6, he makes this statement. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. 
one of the things, the qualities of a perfect and upright man is when he, it doesn't mean that he never falls or he's never had any shortcomings in his life, but when he does, he knows what to do about it. Amen. And then there, it's not, it's not just continuing on and justifying what he's done, it's repenting of it and falling before the Lord and asking for forgiveness. Amen. I, you know, the, these, these altars of the church or what we call altars, prayer bench or whatever, uh, was a, they're there and, and have been there for years. And part of the reasons w was that people used to pray at them, in case you didn't know, <laughs> is that people used to pray and lay things down. And why, why it used to be, hey, come to the altar. What was the altar? It was a place of sacrifice. It was a place of surrender. And when they used to say, come to the altar, it meant come and surrender, come and make right, come and take this opportunity to get your life right with God. And you know what? We, we're not so big that we can't bend the knee. And we're not, you know, we're not so exalted that we can't, exalt, we can't humble ourselves. It's time that we come back. And it, it's not, not so much the prayer benches, it's not so much the altar, it's the positioning of our lives. If we recognize that we have sinned, God is willing to forgive us. But we need to be willing to repent. We need to be willing to abhor that sin and come before him and ask for forgiveness. Amen? If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from how much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness, and that means taking ownership of it, and that's what Job did. He took ownership of his sin. Job was a perfect and upright man. What was God's response to someone that's living a perfect and upright life? Number one, God brags on Job. In fact, he says to Satan in Job 1.8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And so I want, you know, I want God bragging on me. I, I'm not asking God to send forth the, the, the uh, allow Satan to have access to my life the way that, that uh, he, he was given access to Job's life, but I, I'm willing to accept that if that's what it takes to be perfect and upright. Because I desire to be the man of God he wants me to be. And I want to learn and I want to, I want to die more to myself so he can become more in my life. And Job was bragged on to Satan by God. When, when you're perfect and upright, God's bragging on you. God's, have you considered my servant Bobby? Have you considered my servant Kim and Raelle? Have you considered them? You know, they are perfect and upright. There's none like them in all the earth. They, they, they reverence God. They excuse evil. Reverencing God and excusing, not, not desiring and turning away from evil. Goes on, and it's God's response to the perfect and upright. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that you have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namanite, went and did according as the Lord commanded them, the Lord also accepted Job. So not only did God brag on Job to Satan, he bragged on Job to the men that were there to counsel him. And what you're, the majority of the book of Job is Job experiencing these problems and his three friends trying to tell him, tell him why he has those problems in his life. And at the end of the story, at the end of this, what we see, God is not pleased with his three friends. God rebukes his three friends and tells them, I'm going to deal with you after your folly. Job is the one that is perfect and upright. In fact, you need to go to Job and ask him to pray for you. And so they, they, when they heard God, they, that's how they did, and they responded to that. 
I want to be, I want to be a man like Job. I want to I want to be perfect and upright in his sight. And God bragged on, on Job to Satan. He bragged on him to Eliphaz and, and Bildad and, and uh, Zophar. And then uh, God blesses Job's family. You read about the consequences at the beginning. It's don't stop there because you need to read about the blessings at the end. In uh, Job chapter 42, 13 through 15, it says, he also had seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Jem Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third uh, Karen. I'm, I'm abbreviating. And in all the land were no woman found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. So Job blessed his family. He blessed his family. Job remained faithful. He blessed his family, even with, even with the wife that at one time was telling him to curse God and die. I believe she was brought back in line to, who, to be the woman that God wanted her to be, and God blessed his family with abundance of children. And then God blesses him with wealth. In uh, Job 42, 10 through 12, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all that had been of his acquaintances before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels, and 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she-asses. And uh, Job was blessed by God. Job was a perfect and upright man, and when facing the difficulties of life, he didn't charge God foolishly. He didn't blame God, but he worshipped him. He remained integral. And because of his integrity, when he went through that tough time, there was a blessing at the end. I want you to know, no matter how tough the time that you're going through, no matter how difficult it is, if you will remain faithful, if you will remain faithful to God, you will do what he's called you to do. You'll be the man, you'll be the woman that God has called you to be. There's a light at the end of that tunnel. And God will bless you. God's blessings is associated with your obedience and your commitment to his will. I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Then God blessed Job with a long life. It says, after this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. He blessed his life, and he gave him a full life. You know, one of the things about life is, is that God's not, I was just talking to someone this morning, God's just not created us to exist. He's created us to live. He's created us to live. And God wants us to experience life in an abundant way. And God will allow our lives to be full of days and full of abundance if we're obedient, obeying him and remaining faithful. Will there be tough times? Job clearly shows us, yes, there will be. There will be tough times. It rains on the just and the unjust. We recognize that. But as we remain faithful in those tough times, God's, God will bless us. God will bless us. There's blessings associated with our obedience. Now, how did God deal with those who were outside of his will? Well, I just told you that he came against Eliphaz, the Temanite, and his two friends, uh, Bildad and Zophar. And he says, I will deal with you. He says, you need to go and ask Job to pray, pray for you, lest I deal with you after your folly. And I want you to know that when we're outside of God's will, we are we will experience the consequences of, of him bringing us back on track. The chastisement of the Lord is not pleasant, but many times, and it was important for Eliphaz, and it was important for Bildad, it was important for Shofar to get spanked, in a sense, so that they could get back on track with the Lord. And that's exactly what they did. They went to Job, they did exactly what the Lord told them. They asked Job, they repented before Job, asked Job to pray for them, and God was there to restore them. Amen? And uh, God has ways of steering us back on track. He's got ways. And he has ways of correcting us when we've gone astray. Uh, we're told in the Old and New Testament that God is still, 
involved in the chastisement of his children. He said, if God didn't chastise you, you wouldn't be sons, you'd be bastards. That's what the scripture says. It says that you wouldn't, you wouldn't be his child. But because when God chastises you, he does that because he wants you to believe, come back on, on the track. You know, when, when our kids used to go out and, and maybe they'd run in the road, one of the things that I'd do, I might run out there and I might swat them on their behind. I'd say, get out of the road. Why? Because I love them. And because I don't want them hit by a car. I don't do it now. They're, you know, they're in their 30s. But I, don't, I don't do that as often now. <laughs> but at that particular time, at that particular time, it wasn't because I didn't love them. It's because I did love them. Right? I spanked them. I told them to get out of the road. But you know what? I didn't go out and start doing it to the neighbor's kids. I don't want them hit by a car either, but I recognize that it wasn't my responsibility and I didn't have the authority to go out and start spanking the neighbor's kids saying, get out of the road, get out of the road, go on home, you know, stay out of the road. But I, I did that to my own kids because they were mine and I had a responsibility for them. We, we need to recognize that when God spanks us, it's because we're his kids. <laughs> it, we're his children and he's getting us out of the road. He don't want us to get hit by a car, <laughs> right? And so... Uh, it goes on, um, there's blessings through obedience, and there is consequences for disobedience. We know that when we live outside of God's righteousness. Um, the choice is yours. The choice is, is yours and mine. In Joshua 24, 15, it says, if it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. I mean, in other words... You know, there was an old Bob Dylan song years ago uh, when he got con first converted to Christ. He, he came out with a, an album called Slow Train of Coming. How many of you, ever, anybody have ever heard that? He came out with that, and one of the songs he had, had on there was, you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. And uh, uh, Joshua brings out to the people as they were standing there, he says, choose this day whom you're going to serve. Um, if it's the God of your fathers you served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, choose whom you're going to serve. But then he says this, and, and uh, these are the words that I've tried to live by and hopefully you have as well. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You can serve whoever you want, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And this is the direction that we will go. And this is the life that we will live. We're, I'm not going to ask the world for counsel as to how to be a parent. I'm not going to ask the world for counsel how to be a good man. I'm going to ask God's word for counsel. What kind of parent does he want me to be? What kind, of a, what kind of a man does he want me to be? What is the life that he wants me to live? What are the things that he wants me to do? Because there's, I'm not going to stand before this world and give an account when, I face, when, I've, when I'm facing the threshold of glory, but I will stand before the Lord. I will stand before God. I want to encourage you today, and hopefully I have, and, and uh, is just to bring to your attention that these are qualities, and, and we all come up short, there's no doubt about it, and we have come up short, and we, maybe we still are, but there's still room for improvement, and there's room for repentance, and there's room for restoration. Aren't you thankful about that? We can go to the Lord, we can ask him for forgiveness. We can ask him oh Lord, to, to take away our sins, forgive us of our sins, and to restore us, and he will. And uh, if, if, we're, if we have that desire to be that perfect and upright man and wo or woman, let's, let's uh, examine ourselves. Let's take an account of ourselves. And if there's areas in our lives that, that aren't right, this isn't a message of condemnation, it's a message of restoration. It's not to condemn, it's to restore. If, if, if you realize these things are in your life, you realize these shortcomings exist, deal with them. Bring them before the Lord. His restoration is available. Aren't you thankful for that? Yeah. I am. I certainly am. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray for those who are gathered here today. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you for those who you have redeemed. You've called out of a life of sin, and you've brought them into a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. We recognize, O oh Lord, that you have set forth examples within Scripture. In fact, your word tells us there's many things that have happened in the Old Testament. They are for our examples today. And when we look at the life of David, we see 
what a, a man that is after your own heart is like. And when we look at the life of Job, we see the characteristics of a man who is perfect and upright. Father, it's our desire to be who you want us to be. And help us, Lord God, with your Holy Spirit's power and direction to emulate these things in our lives. I recognize, oh Lord God, this applies to me. It applies to us all. We've come up short, no doubt, many, many times. But you are a God of forgiveness and restoration. And as we're willing to come before you and sincerely desire to change, sincerely desire to be who you want us to be, you're there to forgive us, to restore us, and to enable us, oh Father, to walk that road that you have designed for us to walk. And we just give you the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.